Welcome to Making It Happen, a career in the performing arts, where we discuss how to break into the performing arts industry for yourself or your child, teen or young adult. Guests include professionals who are passionate and share my vision of helping talented individuals land professional representation and have successful careers in the arts. My name is Lisa Solek and I am the CEO and founder of Making It Happen, a career in the performing arts. I have helped hundreds of clients break into the performing arts industry on stage, including Broadway, film, television, commercial work, and more. This podcast is supplemental to my groundbreaking online courses. For more information, check out all the ways that you can benefit from my courses, programs, my free newsletter, free guides, and other free stuff. Go to lbctalent.com. My guest today is Fabio Marcus. How are you, Fabio? I'm so thrilled. You have no idea that you're here today. Um, it's great to have it's you. My it's, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. I'm feeling fabulous just for being here with you, having this chance of sharing our experiences and maybe help some people in the way, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, and for all the listeners, um, Fabio is an amazing friend of mine who has a wonderful and amazing background as a public speaker and someone who has been on stages, right, all over the world in 20 countries, I think, if I read correctly, I was like looking yeah, at around these... 20 countries, it's a little bit more than that, but we can say. Oh my gosh. Course. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you've got how many hours of actual stage experience? 16,000 plus hours on stage. That's just, yeah, beyond. Yeah, That's 16, just beyond. 000. That's what, just beyond. So I love it. Yeah. It's my home. I feel at home. <laughs> yeah. Let's like, yes. Just like all the young adults that are trying to do this and the talented people who are trying to, you know, get involved in the performing arts and be successful in that way. And I know you have so much to share about, you know, how you can help them, but let's talk first about how you got started, your journey. I'd love for them to hear about how you landed where you landed. And if you could just start at the beginning, talk about you know, what your loves were and how you ended up being passionate about various things and how you ended up pivoting to what you're doing now. So give us the whole story. Okay, let's say we have four stages, right? Okay, okay. Four stages, uh, amateur, professional, amateur, professional, right? All right, I love it. In the performing arts. Uh, when I was five, I fall from the stairs and I became a stutterer, right? So I had this speaking spe impediment. So uh, from five until 18, I was like uh, using the performing arts as a therapy for me, right? So whenever I was in a restaurant, even at five, uh, and, and the singer that I knew the lyrics for the song would, would play, I would grab a spoon and, and try to impersonate that, that uh, singer, right? Sure. And dancing in the middle of the restaurant it was a way to not be myself for a moment. Mm -hmm. and feel confident uh, by trying to be that person, right? Of course. And everybody was laughing and clapping, so I felt good. Because when I was myself, I was just this short little kid with this stuttering problem, so I didn't like myself very much. So I projected myself into other you know, celebrities. So <laughs> I love I could, it. I could get some love, right, mm -hmm. from, mm -hmm. from strangers, from friends, and, and so on. And then, uh, of course, when I was growing up, I was thinking about my my professional career, and I I thought first I thought okay, let pro I'm probably gonna be an engineer, a technician of some kind, so I don't have to speak to people, right? But at the same time, I knew that I needed to develop myself in a way to be more confident. Mm -hmm, so absolutely. my first kind of arts was the martial arts. So I started. You know, practicing judo, karate, kung fu, and so on, okay. and that helped me a lot to develop my self confidence. But of course, didn't resolve my stuttering problem. Mm -hmm. Then I started studying, uh, you know, amateur theater. So I, I got into the theater and and got theater classes and and acting classes uh, since I was uh, twelve years old. And um, I I did some plays. I, I was part in some plays. I was never the the protagonist. Mm -hmm. except for the last one because it was a story about a stutterer so i was perfect for the role no so way I, was the, I got the main role for that one <laughs> i was 14 at that time incredible and then after that i went to a lot of uh, you know public speaking courses 
I got myself into like 400 hours of training to, to try to really, you know, um, get unstuck, unblock, you know, release my, my communication, you know, potential. And, and it worked. At the age of 18, I was kind of free from stuttering and I was evolving fast. And I had one great advantage during this period that I was, you know, having those problems to communicate to other people. I was forced to listen more, right? Yes. I was forced to pay attention more, to really observe people's attitudes and behaviors before I could try to speak. Because I, I knew when I was going to try to speak, I would have like a short period of like seconds to say what I wanted to say before I got interrupted. Very interesting. You I know how people love to interrupt, you know, the stuttering guy, right? Mm -hmm. They want to complete their sentences and so on. So that gave me this very good competitive advantage because I became a student of behavior and I was able to get the clues from other people when it was my time to, to speak, my time to listen, my time to react. And I, I became very good at it. So when I was like uh, 17, just to give you an idea, the impact of my career, right? At that time, I was decided to go into the engineering thing. But on the side, on the weekends, I was playing a band. I was a drummer. I was a songwriter. And I was dancing. And, and, and I remember, you know, before I could speak, so I, I was focusing more on dancing and performing, right? And, uh, you know, do you remember when the Thriller album came out? Oh, are Michael you kidding Jackson? me? Of course. Personal of course, right? of mine. Are you kidding and me? <laughs> I learned all the choreographies from all the songs. And at that time in Brazil, we had those garage parties, you know, so people would open the garage and threw a party in there. Okay, okay. I love that. And we everybody would that. wait for me. They would wait for me before they play Michael Jackson. Oh, okay. Because okay. I was this guy. I had the red jacket. I had the white socks. You know, I had the glove. And I had the, the, the hat. The whole business. So when I arrived, they go, so hey, Fabio is here. So they played Billie Jean, right? Uh, I would yeah. start doing the moonwalk into the garage. <laughs> and then some spins. And then beat it. And then Thriller. And then everybody got together with me to, you know, to then Thriller. That's and was leading everybody. <laughs> so fun. That's an amazing so, story. I love it. That was my, my way of getting some attention, positive attention, right? When I was sure. not speaking. So when I was 18, I was already in this uh, engineering thing, studying engineering. I was already an associate engineer. Uh, but I always kept those you know, things on Saturdays and Sundays, mm -hmm. dancing and singing and playing with the band. Sure. And... I realized that if I could, let's say, transport or transfer those good feelings I had when I was performing during the weekends, right, having fun and being myself and developing my, my talents, I could transport those into any career, right? True. So I started being this engineer that was a really good listener, I was waiting for the clues for you know, for, you know, for my clients, the, the the right time to speak, to offer something, to and in three years I went from an intern to general manager for a multinational corporation in Brazil. They gave him an entire business unit to take care, right? Incredible. Because actually, you no, know, we are all always we are people dealing with people. <laughs> and no matter if you're acting, singing, dancing, or just talking to someone you need to wait for the clues and say the right thing at the right time right yes can i just interject this is such an important story and i know you have a lot more to share that's going to help everyone but this is something that with what i do with my clients is very prevalent throughout everything i do with them the timing when to use the elevator speech, when to sell yourself, when to, and how to do it in a way that is appropriate and makes the other person feel good. And I mean, there's so many different details to it. So I would love to, we're going to get into it, but I would love to hear more. So what happened? So now you're in corporate. Yeah. And they gave me this struggling business unit that was losing money. Like they were $5 million in debt already. Oh. And I had like six months to turn that around to at least reach break even or 
or otherwise they would close, you know, shut down the mm -hmm. operation. So in six months, we, we, we achieved the break even and, and, and our clients were happy. So I, I, I was given more time, right? And two years and a half later, we were the most profitable in Latin America and the third most profitable in the world in our industry. And then that was my calling to be a speaker and maybe start my way back to performing arts in a certain way. Because at that point, I thought, hey, I'm going to be an executive, right? I'm going to be this mm -hmm. executive, yeah. uh, corporate, uh, whatever, yeah. tracker. <laughs> and then it's OK. But then, I OK, you know, people started calling me, hey, come share with us what you have done in leadership and wow. management, in sales, in negotiation uh, in Brazil. So I started traveling all over Latin America, and then I was speaking to Japan, Australia, United States, and not only speaking to them. Yeah, of course, we're talking about a, a time where there was no Zoom, right? So everything I'm talking to you is in person, right? Yes. So uh, after you know the meetings, we were going to have dinner, and there was like a piano in in, in the restaurant. I would play the piano, and then Michael Jackson would play. I would dance in front of everybody. So I, I was getting this. Everybody was happy because, okay, Fabio is dividing, is sharing with us so many good content about management and leadership and so on, but it's also entertainment. Yes. It's like education with, with entertainment at the same mm -hmm. time. So I got connected with them, not only in the professional level, right? But I made them laugh and sing and dance with me. So they started calling me the fabulous Fabio. <laughs> This is great. Yeah. Well, That's you know what? People learn better that way. You know, it's, it's a better, I don't know, the, to have a really great relationship is so important and how to build that even when you're working on any type of project. So this relates definitively to people who want to be on a team that's produ producing a Broadway show or a film or a television you know, show like they want to have great people to work with them. And I think that sometimes is something that the new actor, the new singer, the new dancer who's working their way and pushing their way sometimes. And I use that specifically the word pushing, which doesn't always work. And I have many conversations with clients about how do you go about creating that relationship? How do you do the networking piece so that yeah. you can land where you're supposed to land? There's a lot of different pieces to that puzzle to try to make it in the performance industry or any industry for that matter. This applies to everything as we know, but um, it's just interesting that you use performance to gain their trust because really you were being very honest with them as a human person yeah. and you were being real with them. And honestly, yeah. my, my experience, my 40 years of doing this and helping clients and doing it myself, that's what wins. Being That's honest right. and real yeah. and sincere and happy and nice, you know? And even to correct your mistakes, you know, because, I, you know, I, I remember you know, I speak Portuguese, right? English is my second language. Uh -huh. And then Spanish is my third language. But I remember the first speech I was given uh, internationally was in, in Texas, in Fort Worth, and then in Dallas. And um, this is very important to remember. In every Everything you're doing is performance, right? Uh in the corporate world, in the, on the stage, you are performing. So you, you have to see yourself as performing. And so you are helping people not only have a good time, but be inspired by you, right? Even if they are way ahead of you, they still can be inspired by you, by your humility, by your, your yes. tenacity, your, your grit, whatever. All of it. And you must believe that your imperfection can be an advantage. I'm not saying that you you should uh, accept, okay, I'm imperfect and I'm going to continue this way. No, I'm just saying that we are not, we're never going to be perfect, right? We are in the constant uh, process of evolution. So if, if you try to present yourself as perfect, you're going to fail, number one. And you're going to be so stressed and so, right? Yes. Uptight, that you you never be yourself and people will not see the real you and when they don't see the real you they don't trust you and when they don't trust you they don't hire you absolutely right? so i remember look, look at this i i was giving my first speech right after my success in brazil as this this young executive 
I was the youngest award-winning executive at that time in the entire world, and the company was in 120 countries. So I was invited to give this speech in Dallas. In, yeah? And then I started, look at this. I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm just going to reproduce my mistake at that time, okay? Oh, perfect. I love this. Go for it. So I was still working on my English, right? My pronunciation and everything. So I started my presentation like this. Imagine 45 top executives, country managers, and my director in the audience, and I start my speech like this. The secret for our, for our success in Brazil is that customer focus. And everybody went, and then I, I didn't realize what I just said. I, I continued. Because for us, every customer is unique. And then my director said, hey, hold on a second. <laughs> How is that possible that you, if they are eunuch? <laughs> and then I didn't understand. And then everybody started laughing, right? Sure. And uh, I was this uh, clown now in front of everybody in my first international speech, right? Yeah. So it was a complete failure, if you can say. But as uh, the way I think is, we are always learning. Mm -hmm. And I cannot abandon the stage for one mistake. So I realized what I did. I apologized, of course, but I continue. And I added so much value to them. And I made jokes about myself and I made all the jokes about my English and I continue and I continue. And one hour later, everybody was giving me this standing ovation and laughing and having a good time, yes. right? Mm -hmm. And later that night, we went to dinner and I was, you know, I was being a, you know, a good sport about it. So people were making jokes and I was smiling and laughing. And finally, at this, at this restaurant, there, you know, there was this one guy playing the guitar, live music. And then I asked if I could play with him. So everybody was impressed. You know, this guy, this, you know, mm -hmm. this, this made this terrible mistake in this internet and he's okay. And he's now he's going to expose himself again. Mm -hmm. And then I sang a uh, blue sweet shoes. Nice. With this guy playing the guitar. I love this. And that, <laughs> that healed everything. That was the cure for everything. Mm -hmm. So for the fact that I accepted my mistake, my imperfection, and I didn't, uh, I didn't feel bad about it. Because I, I understand I'm, I'm evolving. I'm always growing. Mm -hmm. I was able to continue exposing myself confidently until I broke that bad impression. And I, I, I want everybody over again. That's amazing. You know, it's, it's interesting because I think a lot of people who are just starting out in any profession, and of course, most definitely in the performing arts, they want mm -hmm. to be what they think and they have kind of created in their mind as being perfect. And so they mm -hmm. plan or they think that they're going to go into the room or they're going to be at the, you know, being at an audition, they're going to go into the room and they're going to execute in said way that they just have created in their head instead of just being themselves. And I can share with you that in this industry, there are actual, there's coaches and classes for how to walk into the audition and be yourself and be in the moment and have a conversation like a human person and be confident and happy and then yeah. actually execute what they they asked you to bring into the room as far as what the audition actually is because that's so hard for people to just relax and be themselves in that setting so let me ask yeah. you a question you've been on all mm -hmm. these stages you've had thousands and thousands of hours of speaking to thousands of people do you get nervous i get excited uh you know, getting nervous is, it may be the beginning of, of, of the feeling, right? But I have this mantra, right? For me, uh, fear is what triggers the getting nervous thing, right? Mm -hmm. But I have a different meaning for fear. I created this different meaning for fear. So when I start getting nervous, I use that meaning and that becomes excitement, right? So for me, fear means 
fabulous energy to achieve results. I love it. Can I share that when I'm working with people, I'm, I'm, I don't even, even, I don't even use the word nerves or nervous. We talk about energy because as you mentioned, fear triggers, but it's really a hormone that's running through your body, right? It's an, it's adrenaline. Like if we go to the actual physicality and biology of what's going on. And if you learn how to channel that energy in the direction of what it is that you're planning to do on the stage, mm -hmm. in the audition, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And if you learn how to do that, you can be happy with that feeling. That feeling isn't going to, when you start to feel it, you can control it, you can channel it, you can use it to your advantage. And that's exactly what you're doing as well when you say you, you're you moving it into a sense of excitement. So yes. very interesting. We're in the, We're definitely on the same plane in that regard. But it's hard to do too. Like I tell, you know, I tell clients that you have to give yourself, you have to be kind to yourself. You have to give yourself a chance to go into, you know, maybe many auditions. You know, for most people, I say you need to really put yourself out there like five to 10 times before you would come out going, darn, I didn't do what I planned to do in that room. You know, and you mm -hmm. have to kind of work through that. So you have an amazing program also that you offer a lot of guidance, right? So what ended up putting you in that space where you were able to see that, all right, I'm not just doing this for these other companies anymore. And maybe even mention the types of companies that you, the world, world, you know, renowned companies that you work for, but what made you decide and what was the, the turning point that you said, you know what, I need to reach more people. I need to do this for everyone, not just for these companies that are hiring me. So maybe take us through the next part of the journey. Remember I told you uh, I would explain four phases, right? Mm -hmm. In the performing arts. So the first phase when I was using the performing arts as a escape valve to, to feel better about myself and to mm -hmm. win the stuttering problem. That was yes. the amateur phase. Then I, I actually started working in the performing arts as, as an actor doing a lot of commercials in Brazil. And for two or three years, I did that while I was studying engineering and, and, and technical stuff. Oh, okay. So you were doing it. Okay. So I was doing that. But uh, at that time, my my mom, my parents didn't know how to really get into the performing arts for good. So they didn't know, uh, they didn't have you, right? Someone <laughs> who knows the path that can guide them. So sure. they just said, well, this is taking too much time of Fabio's uh, academic uh, life and, and, and no so uh, we don't know if this if this is going to take Fabio anywhere so uh, if Fabio maybe it's time for you to concentrate in your engineering studies and become an engineer or an executive whatever right mm -hmm. so that's when I uh, so I had the amateur phase then I had this professional phase in the performing arts then I went back to focus on engineering so that became again amateur I was just playing for the friends and having this uh, attachment to my executive life you no know? Sure. Using my performance, you know, my performing uh, talents to win people, you know, uh, others trust and so on. Mm -hmm. And then later, uh, when I was already at this international uh, speaker, you know, I had uh, served companies like Apple, Audi, Citibank, Motorola, Microsoft, uh, Schneider Electric, Merck, you name it, uh, 200 of them, right? I have served 200 of major corporations in this 26 years that I've been this international speaker. But when I was in 2000, 2002, I had like six years only working as a consultant and speaker, right? Mm -hmm. uh, motivational speaker and or business speaker. And really music and performing was just this uh, plus I gave people after the business hours, let's say, right? I understand. But then in 2002, my wife came to me and said, uh, you're going to be a dad. And for some reason, my heart said, you must bring art in your life. You must have more of this musical performing thing you have in your day-to-day -day things, right? So I started comp composing again and writing songs and I recorded a, a CD and I started giving shows, you know, and uh, nightclubs and so on. And, 
And then I realized, yeah, I like this, but I don't like the life I'm having because I'm a family man. And I was like you know, oh, yeah. playing until four o'clock in the morning and away from my family. Yes. Then I had an idea. I had an idea. I said, what, what if I combine those things? Instead of doing one thing or the other, I combine them. And in 2004, I created the Motiva Music, which is motivational speeches with music integrated. <laughs> Wait, say that Where again. I write, the, say it I again. write the songs, is... I sing the songs in between my speeches. Um, unreal. And what did you call it? Motiva Music. Motiva Music. I love that. Okay. Yeah. And we, we've done more than 200 shows so far. And that brought me back into this. Uh, I, I'm only, I'm one person. And I, I, I don't want to hide my talents. I don't want to put boundaries. Mm -hmm. So I am, I am the speaker and, and then I'm, I'm performing a sketch on stage about the situation. And then I'm singing and then I'm dancing and I dance Michael Jackson. I dance Elvis Presley. I sing like Elvis. <laughs> so I do all, 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 everything that I like, right? Even sure. the sketches. And, and people have this amazing, unforgettable experience uh, during this this one or two hours show, and it's been amazing. And then I, I I had a fear at the beginning, a, a small fear that maybe my most um, formal clients, right, they would no, I, I don't want Pablo oh, anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was this performing guy. Mm -hmm. On the opposite. They, they hired me more and more for different events, bigger events, larger events. Mm -hmm. right? So it, it is important that you do not waste your talents. No matter what you're doing, what, what, what you're pursuing, be yourself, enhance yourself, try to exercise everything you have without the pretension to be perfect. But with the dream of becoming better every day and serving more get giving more than taking more you know uh, just one one small thing here what really helped me uh win the battle against stuttering and and win every battle i was in and, and stage fright whatever was when i realized when you're performing when you are in an audition or, or in, in any kind of ch challenge, you are not supposed to be thinking about you and how good you want to look for other people. You are supposed to be thinking, how am I serving these people? If you are in an in a, uh, audition, they're, you know, cast directors, cast managers, they are trying to find the right person for their role, right? Mm -hmm. So you're serving them. You're giving your very best. So they have conditions to really evaluate who you are and if you are the, the best fit for their role. Yes. And when you, when you are in the serving mode, instead of uh, exhibition mode, you are in the serving mode, you feel lighter and more free to be yourself. Mm-hmm. Because you're here to add value and help other people solve their problems. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I agree totally. So now I, I'm dedicated to this, what I call magna influence, right? Oh, because yeah. uh, after working for so many corporations, I decided that more people needed what only top executives were getting. People need to build their self-confidence mm -hmm. to a level, what I call unbeatable self-confidence. No matter what happens, no matter no matter the circumstances, you remain positive and and confident on on your capacity to deliver, right? Mm -hmm. And to grow and to learn. Yes, absolutely. So, and then from that point, uh, how you negotiate, how you influence other people, how you look them in the eye, and make them trust you and make them believe in you, because many people you serve, right? They're in the beginning of their career. Yes. So they need a chance. They need an open door. Yes, absolutely. And sometimes you open the door by the way you look at people. You create this magna influence, this magnetic influence, and they go, wow, I, I don't know. I believe in that person. I want to give them a chance. And there is a way to develop this skill of magnetic influence, magna influence, so you show up strong. And even if you don't have anything on your resume 
they look at you and say, well, I'm going to give this guy a chance. So this is so true. And some people naturally have it. There's some people that I've worked with and that I have known over the years that just have that. They're born with it. You know, they got hit over the head with a wand and they can just do that. And others are just, others have it, but they keep second guessing themselves. You know, they keep kind of, they have that imposter syndrome that they think, yeah. oh, I don't know. And they, and the other thing I think they do is they tend to put whoever it is that they are talking to or they are auditioning for, or they're working with on a pedestal instead of saying, you know what? this guy gets dressed every morning the way I do, you know, there's really no difference there, <laughs> you know? So I, I, it's hard to get that out of someone's head when they live in that space. And I talk about the glass being half full versus being half empty. You're, you know, that confident level that you're talking about, how do you get yourself into that state? And we all have been there. We've all been in that confident state, depending on who we're surrounded by. So how do you how do you, how do you multiply that or how do you like relive that in the moments when you feel stressed in some way or you feel that there are stakes involved so can you tell us more about your your magna concept and your program well uh if you look in the dictionary magna means something of great distinction something of great relevance and importance so magna influence would be the most important kind of influence right and it's influence with integrity, influence with excellence, right? So it's influence with authenticity, being yourself. And at the same time, I created this acronym for MAGNA, M-A-G-N-A, -A, right? For me, it means motivations, aspirations, and goals, nurturing agreements. Motivations, aspirations, and goals, nurturing agreements. Smart and so, awesome. If I, when I'm talking to you, when I'm auditioning to, uh, uh, auditioning to you, when I am presenting to you, if I try to think, okay, what might be your motivations in this moment? What might be your aspirations? What might be your goals? And I try to get in, in, in tune with that. I try to harmonize my performance with that. I will be nurturing an agreement. You absolutely it may be a, will be. It may be a formal agreement or a verbal agreement or just a psychological agreement, right? Let's say I'm I'm presenting to you and you go like, wow, Fabio is really hitting right on target. What are my motives, my aspiration, what I want to become and my goal? So he's really helping me with this audition, with this performance, with this presentation. He's helping me get closer to my goals, to my, you know, to fulfill my aspirations. So, you know what? I want to work with him. I want to give him, this is the, the agreement, right? It's a psychological agreement. I want to do something. I want to continue this conversation. This is the kind of agreement you need to influence other people. Because if they decide, no, next, you don't have anything. But if you do anything that starts nurturing this agreement, you have a second chance, maybe a third chance. Maybe you're going to have a lifetime chance yes. to have what you need and you add value to that person, he, add, he or she adds value to you, and you together can add value to society, right? Yes, but you know what? Can I just interject something that you said earlier? The listening factor that you ha you can't just, we talk all the time about living in a bubble, like a lot of these young people, they, they've just come out of their teen years, they're trying, they're either trying to get into coll collegiate programs, <laughs> university programs, or they're in university programs, and they've been chosen from thousands of candidates and they are, you know, and it gives them, it lifts them up, you know, and that's a good thing because we want them to have confidence. But a lot of them are used to all the electronics that they're surrounded by. And that might be some of it too, and that they want instant gratification to some de degree, but they need to listen to others and pay attention to what the director is looking for and, and pay attention to what the adjudicator, the whoever the person is that they're performing for, or that they're talking to, or that they're negotiating with, those they have to understand what the needs are on the other side of that table. And I think you hit the nail on the head with everything that you said and with your program. Um, I th I think people need to to look beyond their their own bubble, their own self mm -hmm. space. Yeah. Um, 
And it's interesting that that you bring it up in that way, that listening that you learned when you were so young as a result of your situation. And now you're using that piece of it to recognize what that person is interested in and what their goal is and what their need is based on whatever the script of the of the music Broadway musical or the the script and the character that they need for their film or their t- TV show or their commercial. And if you're in that space and you're in that mindset, it puts you in a place to be able to execute exactly what you're talking about. You know, and, and this magna really forces you to listen because, okay, I want to know their motivations, their aspirations, their goals. And sometimes you cannot ask, of course, it's not a conversation sometimes, but you can read, you can pay attention to the signs. This is listening as well, right? You can yes. really try to put yourself in their shoes and see what they're looking for. And the most important thing is when you really are thinking, okay, what do I have to know or try to guess uh, from their point of view? You are leaving your body, you're leaving your prejudice, you're leaving your paradigms, and you're putting yourself out there, right? Yes. In in the spirit to serve. Mm -hmm. And, 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 And people can feel it. People can can tell the difference between someone that is just seeking fame and someone that is trying to make a difference and serve. Absolutely. And, and more and more, more and more, uh, we we are involved in this new energy where everybody deep inside they want to have a greater impact. The casting director, the, the you know the the writer, the the actors and actresses, and, and even the you know, you know the cameraman. We want to have purpose in our lives. We want to feel like we make a difference. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to work with someone that just wants to be the best <clears throat> and be a star, right? We want to work with people who are aligned with what we want to accomplish in terms of making that difference. So if you present yourself really humble and willing to give your very best, your true best to serve, people will feel that and they will like you because personality beats performance every time. Absolutely. This you you have got this down to a science which is very exciting because so many people don't look at it that way. And when I've been working with the actors that I work with personally as well as the clients that are, you know, working toward professional representation or they just are working toward being able to get into a room, get into all the right rooms, they're just starting out, they want to build their resume. They 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 tend to live a little bit too much in the space of wanting to get the job. And that's more of a personal, you know, kind of space to, to be living in mentally when, as, and, and it's so, so true because when you get out of that headspace and you change that, that thought process, it's almost like the doors just fling open for you. Yeah. You're, well, everyone wants to accept you. Everyone wants to work yeah. with you. Everyone, everyone wants you to be a part of it. And part of it is recognizing that you need to always be with the director or the supervisor or whoever it is that's in charge. What is their goal for the day? What is their goal for the week? What is their goal for the end of the process? If they're in a lab of a brand new Broadway show, it's not about them showing off and running up to the front and doing a back handspring or a big trick because they're trying to show off so that they personally can have an opportunity to be placed in the show in a certain way so that they're seen more. It's about them watching and and paying attention and listening and staying focused enough to give that director what they need and to stay with them in that process based on what their job is and what their needs are and what the project's needs are and ultimately what the goal of the project is. And it's hard sometimes to make some people understand it enough to execute that way, to be in the room that way. What do you think, do you have any thoughts on what causes someone to be self-centered in that space and be, is, is it worry? Is it fear? Is it anxiety? Why would they be that way in that space if they've already booked, say, the lab of a Broadway show or a project? They're already part of the team. They're already there. You know, I believe a lot of people uh, confuse self-confidence with uh, self-absorption, uh, absorption, right? 
Mm-hmm. So they are so self-absorbed that they they want to be a star. They want to be the best. They want to be well paid. They want to really make a difference, and that's all right. But before you become a team star, you got to be a team member. It. it you know, I want to say that a, louder. I want to scream that on the top of the mountain. <laughs> yeah, before you, you you can be a team star, you got to be a team member. So uh, someday, right, uh, when people see you as someone they love to work with because you really add value to their worlds and jobs, when uh, everybody that works with you, they say, wow, it's wonderful to work with that person, Right you're going to be offered more and more opportunities to 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 have a greater role in any product any production and someday somebody will put you there as a star you don't have to try to you know <clears throat> be there yourself yes. they will put you there you know uh, a lot of people say i i am the best you're not the one to say that exactly. that others say that about you right exactly. That's the best way to to become a star mm-hmm. when you let others show where you are in your light. So true. It's so true. Yeah, the, I always say you're not trying to claw your way to the top of some I want to be famous mountain. That is not how this works. You know, you ha- and and again, we go back to loving the process. Precisely. We talk about that. You have to love the process in that room, whatever that room is with that team, you have to love that process and be so engaged and so about the goals that everyone together as a group, and there's magic that happens in that room. Yeah. And it's, and it's more fun. Yes. Because you're not under pressure all the time, trying to prove your value. You're, you're having fun in the process and everything is lighter and, and flows. Yes. And flows. Energy has to flow. Mm-hmm. When everything is flowing, you can be flying in no time. It's so true. So true. Oh, okay. So we're getting off on these wonderful tangents. I love all of this because it is, um, it's just so important to, to think in the, in this way and to, and to live your, your life in the space that you're in always in this way that you're describing. So, um, I wonder if what we're talking about when people are not in this way in the room with the team, if it comes from a place of insecurity and self-doubt in some way and where that comes from. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, three first steps to build your confidence, right? And if one of them is missing, uh, you're going to be in trouble. So the first, of course, is your motives. What are your motives to do what you're doing? If your motives are superficial, you don't have enough foundation to support the weight, right? Mm-hmm. That you want to carry. Mm-hmm. So your motivations to do what you're planning to do, what are those motivations? Are only just money, just fame, or is there something else? And you sure. better find something else. Yeah. Because money yeah. and fame can come and go. Uh, and when they go, what do you do? <laughs> yeah. You yeah. Have other motivations no matter what happens, you enjoy the training, you enjoy the practice, you enjoy the process, you have yes. fun, you're happy. Mm-hmm. Uh, no matter if you have 1 million, 10 million, 100 million in your bank account, yeah. or even if you have yes. $10, right? Yeah. So uh, if you think about it, almost everybody, or maybe everybody that became rich and famous, once they didn't have anything. But even though without anything, they were chosen. They were selected. They had a chance. Why? Because they were in a good space, in a positive vibration. Yes, absolutely. So motivation is the first uh, element here. Mm-hmm. Then, of course, gratitude. If you don't express gratitude for what you have, you're not going to have anything more. <laughs> it's a universal law. You must be grateful for your current health, your current wealth, your current situation. Otherwise, the universe is not going to give you more if you're not appreciative of what you have. Mm-hmm. So express gratitude. And, the, and you, you can have exercise. Not only think about it, you have to express, write it down, things you're grateful for. And not only the good stuff, because this is easy. I'm, I'm grateful for this role I got. I'm grateful for this money. Be grateful for your problems. Be grateful for your, your sicknesses because they make you stronger. They give you stories to tell. If you want to be a better dancer, a better actor, you need stories to tell. You need be, you, you need to go through those pits, right? 
Yes. So you know how to cry about them if you have a road. To... <laughs> so uh, the, be grateful for everything. So this is the second element. Grateful, gratitude about everything. And the third element is uh, respect who you are and accept who you are. Don't try to be somebody else. You are unique. And now I know how to say it. Unique. You unique. are unique. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if you travel around the world and you meet like 7.88 billion people around the planet, nobody will be like you. That's that's the evidence that you need. You are unique. So be yourself. Accept who you are mm-hmm. with your imperfections. Yes. And, and, and accept this evolution process every day becoming better and better until you have your chance but love the process of becoming better mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you have so to embrace first elements yeah you ha- i love that you have to embrace your type is what we say <laughs> in the in the performance industry you really have to embrace your type and not so much your type as you perceive it but to mm-hmm. understand how others mm-hmm. perceive that type because sometimes that can be skewed And so once you're in that space of embracing that, and I love exactly what you were saying about continuing to learn and grow and, and embrace all of that that's happening Mm -hmm. is going to also get you there and you're going to be happier and you're going to enjoy it. And this three first elements will help you set your goals, which is the fourth element, right? What kind of vision do you have for yourself? It has to be in harmony with this three first steps here your motivations your gratitude and your identity as a person or as a as a performing artist mm-hmm. it, it's like singers you know some singers are great singing country music and they're awful singing opera and vice versa right yes. so you have to accept who you are identify who you are and find your space without trying to please everybody and be everything to everybody you're never going to accomplish that yes so Mm-hmm. Your goals has to be have to be aligned with who you are, mm-hmm. and your time will come. And your time will come. Fabio, you have given us so much insight that is so helpful to all of the listeners, not just the ones going into the performing arts, because we do have listeners because they have they have left me messages and got, contacted me that are not in the performing arts industry who are learning very much from all of the stories and the journeys and the helpful hints and you have given us so much insight but is there anything else before we are finished because we're getting close um any other helpful hints that you might have for a performing artist i would say the major lesson here is don't don't be in a hurry to win. Be in a hurry to grow. You know, learn, learn like crazy. <laughs> really study, practice, grow as a person, grow as a professional, grow in whatever you're doing. This is this has to be your obsession. You should not be obsessed with success or fame or money. Be obsessed with growth. And your time will come and in the process, you have so much fun. I love it. I'm so with you. We're so, we're, we're mind melded. We're on the <laughs> same, we're definitely on that same page. So I'm very excited about something that you have coming up, which just happened to coincide with us talking today for the podcast. It's crazy. Um, And it's an event that you're offering um, where you are talking about in more detail the process that you use to help people to get into this mindset. So can you talk about that and explain what that is so that I really feel that a lot of um, the people that I connect with my clients and people who are listening will want to participate in this. So yeah, if you could give us more information, that'd be great. All right. No problem. Uh, I'm glad to share with you. This is called the Magna Influence Conference, right? The mic, right? The mic, the Magna Influence Conference. It's really, uh, I'm putting together this five-hour immersion on two major uh, acts. Let's say act number one, the forces for excellence that will build your unbeatable self-confidence. And act number two, the best strategies to magnify your influence when presenting, when talking to people, when communicating, negotiating, whatever. Initially, it was for leaders, speakers, coaches, consultants, and experts in general, right? 
because, and, and then of course, you know, talking to you, I realized everybody in the performing arts should learn those things because it, it's hard, right? It's hard to keep your self-confidence up high. It's hard to deal with rejections, no, many times with no explanation whatsoever, why not? And you don't have a chance to talk to people about that. You don't get feedback, right? We do so, not get feedback. That is definitely no not what happens. And when when we don't have feedback, depending on your state of mind, you create your own feedback, and that feedback you create can be damn devastating. Yes. So, I want to help people get into a state of mind that is very productive, right? And at the same time. Build your self-confidence to a place where you're gonna be you're gonna be much more successful in any audition, any any performance, any any challenge you're facing. Number one. And then I'm gonna give you how you deal with those internal conversations in your head and those external conversations with other people to be much more effective in convincing people to give you a chance to listen to you to watch you perform, to give you this uh, opportunity. And, you know, there is a science behind this. Uh, only goodwill or grit or motivation, we, we're not going to do it. You need some strategies in place so you can build your, your mindset and your skill set to be really effective in everything you do. So this is going to be very, uh, very interactive and intense. So this is a five hour immersion to really help you go deep into how you build the mindset and the skill set you need to influence with excellence, with total integrity and make people in a good way, make people give you a chance to perform, to speak, to negotiate with them so you can get better results faster with less effort and with less frustration, which is very yeah, Yes, yes. So I'm sure there's so many listeners that would love to get in touch with you and hear more about you, read more about you. Can you give us a connect so that they can connect with you in a, in a bigger way? Perfect, perfect. The best way to get in contact with me is through my personal website. It's fabio360.com. So F-A-B-I-O 360.com because there you're going to have access to all my social media, my WhatsApp, my, my, my phone and my, my websites. And it's the best way to schedule a conversation. If you want to talk to me one-on-one, -on -one, there's a way there to schedule your conversation with me so we can see if I can help you somehow. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Fabio, so much for being on our podcast. I'm just very excited to to hear all the comments from the listeners and you know to to kind of connect all of them to your expertise you're amazing thank you very much lisa actually you are fabulous <laughs> and i i feel so honored and so blessed to have met you and to have this chance to share a little bit from my experience to try to help your listeners and your your audience awesome thank you so much if you'd like to connect with Fabio and learn more, go to Fabio360.com and join me Sundays at 8 p.m. Eastern. Do you need more information? Visit LBCTalent.com and follow me on socials at Lisa Solek underscore LBC Talent. By sharing our stories, we can help other talented individuals land the career of their dreams. If you're enjoying this podcast and gaining insight and information that is helpful to you, please like and subscribe.